Okay, so next we have Jamie Andrews, and I'm excited that he's going to tell me what's wrong with my program. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jamie Andrews, uh, University of Western Ontario, and um, I have a program here to show you. Um, it's called Movie Database. And it's a very simple program with a little scrolling interface that uh, just lets me add uh, movies and what ratings I give them and uh, remove them from the database, show them what the rating is that I've given them. So let's, uh, let's test it out here. Let's see, see how it works. Um, I'm going to add, uh, let's say, Alien with a rating of uh, 5. Uh, show Alien. Uh, that seems to have worked OK. Um, add uh, Juno with the rating of, let's say, four stars out of five. I, I accessed a list of movies with one word titles so that I could, I could figure out what, so that I wouldn't have to type very much. Uh, OK, so that seemed to work. Add, uh, let's say, Rambo. Uh, let's say we give it uh, one. Uh, too generous? I don't know. So show uh, Juno, that seemed to work. Show uh, Rambo, uh, uh, yeah, that works. So let me do some removing here. Remove uh, Rambo, whoops. Uh, remove, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> remove Rambo, OK, movie Rambo deleted. Remove. Uh, Juno, movie, movie Juno deleted, remove Alien. Movie Alien does not exist in database. That's strange. I wonder what happened there. Show Alien. No, it's not there. Uh, let's try that again. Add Alien uh, with uh, rating 5. Add. Uh, Juno with rating four. Is that still in the database there? Alien. Yep, it's still there. Uh, show Juno. OK, that's still there. Remove Juno. Show Juno. No, it's not there. Show Alien. OK, something's going wrong here. This is, I. I added these two movies, Alien and then Juno, and I only deleted one of them, and the other one is gone now, too. That's, that shouldn't be, if you have a database, you sort of expect that when you put something in the database, it's going to stay in there and, until you explicitly take it out. So uh, there's something wrong with my program here. What's wrong with my program? So uh, what's, what's your theory? What's, what do you think is wrong with my program here? Any theories? List? I heard the word list. What, what about the list? It's inadvertently deleting everything that's in the list. OK. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, if I, uh, But I, I deleted Rambo first, and it seemed like Juno was still in the database, right? So couldn't be exactly that. Uh, any other theories here? I asked this question at my university, at my department, and somebody said, I know what's wrong with your program. You didn't use formal specification. You should have, you should have formally specified it. And uh, so different, different perspectives. But I think you're, you're close. You're, you're very close. Um, so uh, yeah, there are various different interpretations of this question, what's wrong with my program, that we, that we ask. Sometimes we could be saying, "What if anything is wrong with my program?" So, like, is there anything wrong with my program? You know, you give it to a tester and say, "Okay, what's wrong with this?" You know, assuming that there are going to be bugs, where, what are the bugs? So, uh, another way of saying that is, "Does my program do what it's supposed to do?" So, I used to work in. Uh, do research in semantics of programming languages, and I could never explain to anybody what I what my research was about. Now I work in software testing, so when someone asks me what I do research on, I say, "Well, software testing. So testing programs to see whether they do what they're supposed to do." And everybody understands that. I never get any any questions after that. 
So a more technical way of expressing this might be, does my program conform to its specification? And that specification could be some formal thing or just a very informal thing. Um, so uh, a related question to that would be, what are the best ways of finding out if anything is wrong with my program? And 99% of the time in industry, what that means is testing the software. Uh, so what are the best ways of testing software? How can we compare them to each other? We could be asking when we say what's wrong with my program, not just to get one particular test case that fails, but what are the sort of patterns of failure of my program? Can I get several different failures that expose what generally is wrong with it? And we could be asking actually, what are the faults in my source code that have caused uh, the failure of the software? So let me go over some terminology that we use in testing, just so that we're on the same page and saying, using the same terms for things. When I say test input, I mean the input to the program that we use to run the program to, to run a test case. When I say test output, I mean the output that the program gives me in response to that input. So a test suite then is a suite, and sometimes you hear test set or test bucket or things like that. It's a set of test cases where we give the test inputs, and usually we want to give the expected outputs for the test as well. So a test oracle is a program that's used to check the output of another program on tests. Um, and usually we uh, might program that, or we might just have a human evaluating at test outputs. So a success is an instance of correct test output. A failure is incorrect test output, where it's done something wrong. And when I say failure pattern, I'm talking about like groups of failures that look related to each other. So a fault, then, is the incorrect code that leads to a failure. So in testing, we want to make a distinction between those two things. So we sometimes use the term bug, like this guy or, or, or whatever, uh, informally to mean either a failure or a fault. So we might, have, we might look at what I just showed you on the screen and say, that's a bug. Or we might look at some code on the screen and point to a line of code and say, that's a bug. Right? So we use failure and fault to make a distinction between those things. So the research areas that are relevant to this question that I'm going to be talking about today are, well, the standard approaches to testing and comparing them. Uh, in my research group, uh, recently we've been working on something called randomized unit testing, where you use uh, an element of randomization in the, the testing. And we would like to be able to measure the effectiveness and compare the effectiveness of testing techniques. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to talk about some research on fault localization, that is, uh, finding what the fault is given a failure. So I'm going to be talking about work that I've done in collaboration with these folks that, that are listed up there, and also about research that other people have done that I'm just interested in and that I've started to do some work on. And uh, those are some of the people who have worked on that. So standard approaches to testing are things that have mostly been developed in industry rather than in the ivory tower. Uh, black box testing or functional testing is where we go through the requirements. We analyze the requirements and try to figure out test cases from that. Uh, white box testing, which is, I suppose, supposed to be the opposite of black box testing, is also called structural testing, and it's where we use tools that show what statements have been covered by a set of test cases and then try to find new test cases that cover those um, statements. So that's one way of dividing the testing task uh, up. And there's another dimension of classification of testing tasks where we talk about system testing versus unit testing. And unit testing is where we're testing methods and groups of methods and classes. So this is usually something that's done by a programmer. And a unit test case is um, a piece of code that contains calls to the methods that we're interested in testing. So a standard tool for, for that for Java is JUnit. How many people have written JUnit test cases here? OK, so a fair, fair number of uh, people in both, both people that I recognize from our uh, program committee and also people who are uh, attending from Google. So um, basically, you're, you're writing 
sequences of method calls, possibly preceded by uh, setup of the arguments and possibly followed by checking the results. And that's basically all that JUnit does, but it does it in a, in a very nice, with a very nice interface and um, uh, with tools that, that help you to, to do that. So what I would like to know is, is there anything better for unit testing than just doing the standard white and black box testing with JUnit or something like that, like CUnit or uh, some of the other XUnit um, things? So what we've been looking at is randomized unit testing. And what that means is you write a driver program that um, randomly selects a method to call uh, among the methods that you're interested in, randomly selects arguments, calls the method, reports the results, and then just keeps on doing that, like hundreds of times, thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times, whatever. So it definitely needs a test oracle of some kind because you're making basically thousands of test cases, of running thousands of new test cases. So you can't have a human evaluating that all the time. You need something which is doing some kind of evaluation of those, those results. But the potential benefits you get are that you're able to generate lots of inputs quickly. And you might generate unexpected inputs, inputs that you didn't think were going to cause a failure, but that do. And uh, that you're evaluating those results automatically. So the analogy here with the dartboard, this is supposed to be a dartboard. I didn't bother to color it in uh, all the way. but. Um, with our standard uh, techniques, we're sort of aiming very carefully darts at this dartboard and trying to hit all of the little bits of it that we're supposed to hit and you know, using our intelligence to think, cross off all of the um, uh, requirements and all of the lines of code. With randomized testing, it's like we're just taking a machine gun and going, <laughs> you know, just shooting up the dartboard, spraying it with, Bullets, this is the last time I can use this joke because it's on YouTube now, so I can't, that's the end of that, of the dartboard joke. Anyway, th so the idea is we're, we're just covering that, that dartboard with, with bullets and it might uh, hit some of the squares twice or 10 times or whatever, it might blow the dartboard off the wall, whatever. Doesn't matter because we're generating so many of them. So we did some experiments on this on doing randomized unit testing of some data structures. And we found that um, when we compared this randomized unit testing to just kind of standard black box testing techniques, what we got was that the randomized unit testing was about 23% more effective and only took about two and a half long, times longer in CPU time than these black box uh, test cases. And when we augmented that test suite, the black box test suite, with test cases that achieved 100% condition decision coverage, um, what we got was that the randomized unit testing was still 4% more effective and only took about one and a half times longer in CPU time. And the amount of time, the development time, we didn't measure that uh, so accurately, but we think that it was comparable. Uh, so when, when we saw that, we thought, this is weird because this isn't something that they tell you about in textbooks. It's, this isn't supposed to, to work very well. Randomized testing gets, gets uh, a really bad rep. So we downloaded some data structures packages from SourceForge that were well tested. They were considered to be um, uh, stable releases and had test suites along with them and tested them, and we found lots of bugs. We didn't find that it took a lot of development time, and uh, some of the results of that are reported on in a paper in ASC, the Automated Software Engineering Conference in 2004. We developed something called Randomized Unit Testing Engine for Java, and uh, this was inspired by JUnit, and we found uh, some bugs in an example unit that is with the JUnit distribution. Uh, money and money bag example. So something that no one had, had noticed before in the JUnit distribution. And we also found a bug in uh, Java util, java.util uh, bit set of uh, version 1.4. It turned out that that bug, we looked on the Sun database and it had already been reported on that database. But it's interesting that we found, you know, our little research group in, in Ontario found a, a bug in uh, Sun's uh, uh, production code. So um, you guys have been very uh, quiet and you haven't called me on what on earth I mean by more effective. 
but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Let me just tell you what the, the fault was in my program, and you're very close, uh, Colin. It was a hash table. It was one of these hash tables that's, uh, that was among those SourceForge data structures. And what it was doing is the hash buckets were linked lists, and it wasn't updating a trailing pointer as it was removing things. And uh, so when you remove something in the middle of the hash bucket, it removes everything before that in the hash bucket. So um, this was something that we found with the randomized unit testing. So in particular, what I, I cunningly devised this program so that it had, it was a hash table of size three and Alien and Juno, are, I, I was using the first character modulo three as a hash uh, code and so those are the same thing modulo three and they go into the same hash bucket and so when I deleted Juno it deleted Alien as well. Now I don't really blame the guy for not finding this bug because it's quite difficult to find that. What you have to do is you have to add two things to the same hash bucket you have to delete the second thing that you put in, and then you have to check that the first thing is still there. Would that really occur to you to, to write that test case? Not necessarily. Okay, so um, let's uh, look at uh, what I mean by measuring test effectiveness. Intuitively, um, we would say that a test technique A is more effective than a test technique B if A forces more failures than B. So we're, it's some way of selecting test input so that we get more failures. So the ideal experiment to do on that to see if A is more effective than B would be to get programmers to apply those to their programs. So you sort of locate 30 programmers somewhere and get them to apply a test technique A for a week to their, or two weeks or whatever, to their programs, and then same thing for test technique B, and when you've expended all those, you know, thousands of person hours on the experiment in, in a company, then maybe you can find that you have enough statistical significance to make a, a claim. Uh, unfortunately, it's extremely labor intensive to do that kind of uh, work, and it's, uh, generally considered to be infeasible to do those kinds of experiments. So the usual simplification of this that you see in, in uh, research papers is an experimental technique that was developed by, mostly by these folks, Phyllis Frankel, uh, Monica Hutchins, Tom Ostrand, and some of their co-workers in that period, where you simulate A and B by selecting test cases from a big test pool and you do that on many faulty variants of a program. Now, acquiring those faulty variants, there are basically three techniques for doing that. We could develop a program and identify the faults that are in that program while we develop it, and then reseed those faults back into the program in order to get these faulty variants that we're trying the testing techniques on. Uh, that's also very labor intensive, and there's a lot of bookkeeping that you have to do to remember what the bugs were and where they were and to uh, take them out in a very careful way so that you can reintroduce them. You can go instead to programmers and get them to hand seed realistic faults. Go to a programmer and say, okay, put in some, some faults in here uh, and make them realistic. Okay, so that's a, less, a little less labor intensive because you just have to spend a few hours doing that, but it's very subjective. It's very difficult to reproduce that kind of experiment. In, in a rigorous way. So another way is to use some kind of program called a mutant generator to generate so-called mutants of the program. And the question there is whether the mutant generator is realistic. We don't have a problem with labor intensiveness. You just press a button and, and you get all these mutants. And it, we don't have a problem with subjectiveness there either. It's totally objective. You take this program, you give it to another researcher, that's what they use on their, on their um, uh, programs. So um, let me go into a little bit more detail about this mutant generation. Uh, so here's a mutant. He's uh, basically the same as, um, as any of us, except he has four arms and uh, pink skin and all that. And uh, so a, a mutant of a program is basically the same as any other program, except it possibly has a little fault put into it. So um, it's uh, something that's generated from a program by applying a mutation operator. So a typical mutation operator would be replacing a less than by a less than or equals. That might cause a fault in the program. 
So we say that a test input kills a mutant M of a program P if M is, if the test output of uh, P is different from the test output of M on the same inputs. So we're just sort of assuming that that means that that's something that triggered a fault. So the, uh, the main point then of, of testing when we evaluate it this way is to kill the mutants. Kill all mutants. All mutants must be destroyed. You're not laughing, but I can tell that you're, you're smiling, so that's, that's good. That's all I can expect. Um, so yeah, we judge a testing technique A then to be more effective than B if A kills more mutants than B. And uh, that is the, uh, what we used in that random, randomized unit testing evaluation. So again, the question is, is this realistic? Are, we re are these faults that we've, we've seeded really realistic? So we did a little experiment on this, I and two colleagues at Carleton University, Lionel Briand, Yvon Labiche, and uh, then my PhD student, Dr. Siami Amina, joined us on that later. Um, we accessed eight very well-studied subject programs. Seven of them have these hand-seeded faults where they went to developers and said, look, put in some realistic faults. And one of them was one of these programs one of the very, very few programs that was developed in a very careful way with, where they were keeping track of all of the faults and then reseeding them back in. Um, and they all came with very large pools of test cases, which is what we need for simulating different testing techniques. So we generated mutants from all those programs and generated all, lots of test suites from the test pools. And then for each one of them, we compared the ratio of the mutants killed with the ratio of the faults killed. So this is what we found when we compared the mutants that we generated to these hand-seeded faults that programmers put in. So these, uh, each of these dots represents a typical test suite of a particular size. So this dot is saying that a test suite of size 10, 10 test cases, kills about something like 15% of the hand-seeded faults in these programs. But a typical test suite of size 10 kills about something like 75% of the mutants that we generated, and so on across all of there. So we found that the mutants were easier to kill than the hand-seeded faults. The mutants that we generated seemed to be more simple, or um, that these, these test suites seemed to be able to detect them more easily than the hand-seeded faults. So what, did, what, what about when we looked at the real faults in the program that had real faults, well, we found that they were almost identical. Uh, in fact, the mutants were slightly harder to kill than the real faults, but that it was almost the same thing. So as far as um, evaluating or comparing two testing techniques, it seems that if, there, if we're talking about real faults, that these are, um, it is possible to use mutants as stand-ins for real faults. And we also, the implication is that um, when the programmers seeded these faults into these programs, they were putting in unrealistically hard faults. They were putting in faults that were more, uh, more difficult to detect than typical faults that you get from real programs. So this paper uh, came out in International Conference on Software Engineering in 2005. It has already had more citations than all of the other papers that I've ever written put together. And I think it's because this is giving researchers something that they can use in their research. And researchers are the people who write papers, right? And so I may have done all kinds of things that are used by people in industry, I don't know, but they don't tend to write papers as much. So uh, this is um, uh, something you can find on, on Google Scholar, actually. Okay, now uh, I want to also talk about a little bit about um, some stuff that is coming along that I'm very excited about and interested in. I haven't personally done that much work on it yet, but uh, I want to uh, get into that. So let's say that we have some failing test cases. Um, can the computer help us to find the fault that corresponds to uh, the failure? And I hope that no one who's listening here or watching will be too offended if I say that the current state of the art, or at least very close to it, is the Tarantula system that was developed at Georgia Tech 
um, by Jim Jones, who's coming to, to work at uh, UC Irvine in a few months, and Mary Jean Harold and uh, some of their colleagues. Uh, so there, there, are, there are other approaches, and, and not completely comparable, but, um, but this is very close to the state of the art, at least. So um, let me tell you about the tarantula algorithm. I got this from WP Clipart, that site. I don't think this really is a tarantula, but it's called a tarantula on, the, on WP Clipart. Uh, the, so the tarantula algorithm is the, the input is a program and a set of successful test cases and a set of failing test cases. And the output is a ranked list of program lines, where the most suspicious is at the top and then the least suspicious is at the bottom. So the algorithm basically is you run the program on all of those test cases, you uh, store the data on which lines were executed by the successful and failing test cases, and then you input all of that into a big formula to get a ranking between 0 and 1 for each line. So let me, um, I'll show you something for the movie database, which is not really, it's not tarantula, but I'll, I'll give you a flavor of, of what happens with it. Um, I will show you some, um, let's see, success input.txt. This is a successful test case. This is input that succeeds um, for my little program. There's some input that fails, right? So this actually, I, I designed these to be as close as possible to each other, but this is the one that manifests the bug because uh, we remove Juno first. We remove the second one first. And this one works fine. This, this works perfectly. So I have a little script here. Uh, what is it called? Compare.bash. So that just, uh, what it does is it runs the um, hash table application, the, or sorry, the movie database application on the successful input. And then it runs a program called GCOV, which is something which measures the lines of code that were, um, that were executed by a test case and puts a report on something uh, with the, the extension GCOV. And so I do that with a successful and with a failing uh, test input. And then I compare those using diff. So I get uh, the diffs between those in this file, diffs.txt. OK, so details aren't that important, but let's run that and see what we get, compare.bash. Uh, I have to say dot slash because I haven't set up my path. OK, right, so it did all that. And um, we get from, what we get from GCUB is, <clears throat> a little, and this is a public domain, uh, thing that comes with GCC, by the way. If you have GCC, then you have GCOV. Uh, it tells us how many lines have been executed, and uh, let me just show you like this success uh, dot uh, GCOV file. This is what we get. We get the source code on the right-hand side, the line numbers here, and here in this column, we have minus if there's no executable code. We have a number if it's been executed, if that line of code has been executed that number of times. And we have a line of hashes if it hasn't been executed at all. So here we see that this line has been executed three times and four times, two times. These lines haven't been executed, and so on. So let's look at that diffs.txt and see what we get. So what this is telling us is that on the successful run, line 71 and 72 were run four times and two times, respectively. And they were on the failing run, they were run five times and three times, respectively. And all the other lines of code were run an identical number of times. So let's, this is all of the differences here, 71, 72, 75. Let's look at that um, uh, source code. Go to line 71. I'm a VI guy. Yeah, so this is, this is it, basically. This, there's a the trailing pointer prior P that isn't updated. And this is precisely where the bug is. You can see that I have a, a fix that I put in, and I've commented it out so as to retrieve that failing behavior. So it was able to, something, some analysis like this was able to find basically where the fault was. Um, now, Tarantula doesn't do that. It's more sophisticated than that. It uh, has this big formula, but um, it works uh, pretty well. How do we evaluate how well it does uh, and tools like it? 
Well, there's now a sort of standard way of evaluating and comparing these tools, which was developed mostly by some people in Germany, um, uh, Kleve, Holger Kleve and uh, Andreas Zeller. So um, what we're doing is we're assuming that the programmer is basically looking at this ranked lines. We have this model of programming, programmer behavior where they're looking at these rank, the, the ranked lines and they're going down through each line and seeing whether is that the fault, is that the fault, is that the fault. And so when they actually get to the actual faulty line, we're assuming that that's the end of the search process and they have found it and uh, all that. So the saving that we get through using one of these tools is how much of the program does not need to be examined by the programmer when they're aided by this tool. So we can say that that's the accuracy of Tarantula or, or tools like Tarantula, is the, the percentage of the program that does not need to be examined. So what we can do is we can run Tarantula on different faults with different test suites and various things and compute how often the accuracy score is greater than a given value because it does depend on the kind of fault and the kind of test suite that we have. And this is the same with all tools like this. So here, for instance, is uh, a, something that I took directly from the Jones and Herald uh, Automated Software Engineering 2005 conference paper. It shows that, uh, for instance, here, this, this uh, point at the right beside the 40 means that in 40% of the test runs for this particular program, um, it was the programmer did not need to examine 99% of the code. So it localized the fault to within 1% of the lines of code. This one means that in, in uh, yeah, something like 87% of the test runs, the 90% of the program did not need to be examined. So we want this to be up in this corner as much as possible and up at the top as much as possible. We want as much space underneath the curve as we possibly can. So it was able to, to fairly accurately determine the locations of these faults. Now this program, this space program, is one of these famous subject programs and this is the one with the real faults that I talked about earlier that um, uh, where they, they developed it and kept track of the real faults and then reseeded them. So we did that same process in our uh, research group with another subject program which we just developed. It's called Concordance. And this is what we, and we, we've been sort of repeating all sorts of classic experiments with this, uh, one, with this new subject program. And this is what we found for Tarantula. So what we found is that it did very poorly on one fault. That's why we have this big gap at the top. There was one fault that Tarantula just couldn't handle at all, and it gave the worst possible score for the actual faulty line. Um, but if we ignore that one, it actually did fairly well, fairly similarly. So on about 20, uh, what is that, 23% of the test runs, um, it was able to localize it within 100%. So if we go backwards and forwards between these two things, we can see that it's pretty much the same except for the, the part uh, right at the top there. So um, this is sort of an independent corroboration or a, a repetition of an experiment, the kind of thing that we want to do in experimental studies. So I, as I said, I haven't done that much research on Tarantula yet, but uh, we're starting to do that in our research group. The kind of thing that I want to know is how does it perform on another program with real faults? Well, I just, I just showed you something about that. Does the composition of the test suite affect the accuracy of Tarantula? And actually, Jim Jones at, at ICSI this year, at the International Conference on Software Engineering this year, gave some results on that. Um, does the nature of the fault affect the accuracy? Something about the, the fault that could, be, that could cause differences. How does it perform on mutants versus the real faults? Um, so this is the research that um, one of my students, uh, Wan Tao Wang, is doing for his MSc studies. And um, I, I also have a, a PhD student named Chaima Ali who's interested in how uh, how you could use machine learning techniques to learn about how faults correspond to failures from all of the test data and maybe come up with some, something better than Tarantula. I mean, basically, we don't know how Tarantula works or why it works. It's this formula. Are there other formulas that might work better? And other people have, have proposed different formulas. I also want to see how randomized unit testing fits into all of this because 
the potential would be that you could uh, take your, your software, run your randomized unit testing, get a lot of failures out of that, maybe some successful test cases, feed all of that into a fault localization uh, process, and get some idea of where the fault is. So uh, a lot of automation right from the when you've got a clean compile all the way to maybe guessing at where there might be some faulty lines in the unit. So I haven't been able to talk about a lot of research that, uh, that we've been doing, especially in randomized unit testing. There are some people at NASA, including uh, Alex Gross, who have been working on this for um, testing Unix implementations that are going to be on spacecraft and comparing them to um, Unix um, uh, implementations on other platforms. There's this idea of differential testing where you have a reference implementation and also a new implementation uh, is one place where you can use randomization because you have an oracle already. You have the, the other reference implementation as an oracle. So I have a, another master's student, Melissa Weston, who's working on um, doing randomized testing for uh, device emulators like cell phone emulators or uh, game console emulators to see how reliable they are. So lots of, lots of research in this area. Uh, I hope I've given you a flavor of some of it. Um, I usually have had in the past as my last slide a picture of a light bulb, which is the universal symbol for bright ideas, and then thank you, and then any, any questions. Unfortunately, the slide that I had used an incandescent light bulb, and that's just not, you can't do that in California these days. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, thank you. Random test cases, yeah. So when you guys uh, ran uh, random test cases, what, what method did you guys use to uh, verify that the correct out, that the output for each of the random inputs is right. correct? Right, okay. Yeah, I'll, uh, I actually have something on my, on my demo directory for that as well. Um, so uh, I have a, the thing that we had was, um, I'll show you what the driver does. So um, H table driver. So this is just, oh yeah, I have to give it a number of calls. So what this is is um, something where I can run it and I can give the number of calls to these hash table functions that I want to make and it'll call them and I've decided that I'm gonna use like integers as the keys and integers as the um, uh, data as well. So HA will put 13, 14, 6, 13. That means key 13 and 14, 6, 13 as the data, and it's inserting that. So what we get out of the driver is something like that. Uh, I can say I want 100 calls. I can say I want 1,000 calls, and, you know, it, it, it takes not very long to, to do that. So what does the oracle look like? Whoops. Um, the Oracle is, this is actually what sort of led us to this, um, uh, this whole area of randomized unit testing. We were using um, state machine based test oracles where we're assuming that we're, we have a log file like from one of these random drivers as input to the Oracle and then we're describing what it would mean for that output to be correct. And we're using the same assumptions about the input, so that it's integers and that kind of thing. Uh, so we found that this isn't that difficult to, to write, but um, another sort of piece of evidence that these oracles might not be difficult to write is JUnit and, and the fact that people are doing that in JUnit quite a lot now. So I don't really, uh, this is some, th this work on log file analysis was stuff that I was doing a few years ago. and. If you're doing it in Java, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing it this way. Um, there's somebody called Harry Robinson who used to work at Microsoft, I think now he works at Google actually, who's, who's worked on model-based testing and what he means by that is you write a model uh, maybe with a very simplified data structure which is something which is supposed to be a model of the, the actual unit or the actual program that you're testing and that's what serves as your oracle so you're just you're just using some kind of simplified um, version of it does that answer your question is that does that get to, to what you're asking okay 
Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.